Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you had a good weekend. Here with uh, Paul and Josh, of course. Uh, Charlene Russell Tucker, Commissioner of Education, is back to, um, and as well as two uh, friends I'll introduce you in a minute. Um, I really wanted to talk a lot today about jobs and uh, getting people back to work. That's part of the healing um, as we move, hopefully, past COVID. But first and foremost, the job is making you feel comfortable that it's safe to get back to work. So let me give you an update on where we are on uh, infections and um, what we're doing to get people vaccinated. Very quickly, you can see the numbers are still very good and continue to trend in the right direction. Um, seven day average less than uh, 2%, 1.4 uh, for the last three days. Uh, hospitalizations the lowest in uh, seven plus months. Um, so we're making good progress there. And this is all a precondition. If we're going to get things reopened next week in a significant way, probably our last step of reopening, these numbers uh, help pave the way. Again, that's because people are getting vaccinated, for which uh, Connecticut continues to be a leader, and that's thanks to each and every one of you. Um, 71% of the people 18 and above have been vaccinated. 80% of the people 45 and above. 92% of the people 65 and above. Let's hear it for that age group. What that means is uh, 45 and above, we're very close to uh, what they call herd immunity. I know that's a moving target, but you add that 80% who have been uh, vaccinated along with um, uh, those who were previously infected over the last year or have some antibodies, we're in pretty good shape there. Um, look, we got a little bit of work to do with the younger demographic, but we're doing pretty well, 70 percent, 18 and above. 16 and 17-year-old, 50 percent. So for that, I really thank you. That makes a big difference, and that we moved on that pretty quickly. Uh, that may be as a harbinger of good things to come when it comes to the next round, which we anticipate from the FDA uh, Food and Drug Administration within the next uh, you know, three days, that would be authorization for Pfizer, Moderna, uh, 12 to 15 year olds. And uh, one of the reasons Charlene is here, she'll give you an idea of how we plan to roll out for that age group using the schools for notification. Uh, if we can do as well with that age group as we're doing with the uh, 16 and 17 year olds, it is gonna be a very good summer. Uh, again, the vaccines are working. This is probably a chart you feel like you've seen before because we gave you this chart as regards Israel going back um, a few weeks ago. Israel is, say, three weeks ahead of us on the curve. And we showed you back then that once uh, Israel got to a 50 percent um, of the total population vaccinated, um, you saw the infection rates uh, go way down. We're now at um, uh, 57 percent of our total population vaccinated. And uh, that means, you know, zero through. And uh, you see our numbers are dropping off as well. Uh, fair warning, we're at 57% total. Israel, which had a three-week head start on us, is only at about 60% now of their total population vaccinated. So there I hope they're not a, a canary in the coal mine that vaccinations fall off. We got to still keep our pedal to the metal on this working with our younger people, um, drinks on us, uh, get ready, because that's coming next week, get vaccinated. So let's talk about jobs. There was a lot of discussion about this um, over the last uh, five days. You saw the job numbers came in on the federal level. People were expecting, hey, a million jobs, we're overheating the economy, um, happy days are here again. It was actually about a quarter of that number. Uh, so it just reminds us we still have some work to do around the country, and we have some work to do in Connecticut. Although we have made a real priority of getting people back to work uh, over really the last, uh, you know, 12 months since we started reopening on May 20th um, last year. So there are a variety of reasons that people are maybe still a little hesitant to get back to work. Uh, some of it may be just, um, especially here in the Northeast where we're particularly hit by COVID, I do think there is some uh, COVID hesitancy. That's why these vaccine numbers are so important to give people confidence. It's safe to go back to work. There's been a lot of talk about the $300 true up in the unemployment um, numbers. Uh, maybe for some in the service sector, that's been an impact, but Look, the service sector did grow faster than any other sector in terms of employment over the last um, 
month. That's true. And certainly in places like Texas and Florida, where there's a lot of service sector employment, uh, the unemployment is not discouraged as much, but it's still worth looking at. Child care. A lot of folks, especially women, particularly hard hit, first to lose their jobs, first to lose their business, home, child care expenses, nowhere, schools closed. That has slowed things up, especially for a women getting back into the workforce. Uh, that's why um, Miguel and now Charlene, we made such a priority of getting our schools open on time last September. You see child care. We talk about child care in terms of the advantage it gives a, a kid at the start of life. Also, by having the biggest expansion in daycare and child care in the history of the state. Thank you, Beth Bai. Thank you, Joe Biden. Um, uh, it's going to allow more um, people, more single parents, more uh, moms to get back to work. I hope that makes a difference. Same with our summer um, learning camps, summer enrichment programs, they call it here. We're going to have that available, I hope, to um, we're providing resources for 24,000 um, kids. And if uh, towns and superintendents match us on that, we'll be able to get uh, the overwhelming majority of young people who haven't been in school for much of the last year uh, a summer learning experience, and that allows their parents to get back to work. Uh, Debt-free community college is uh, making that more available, and you'll hear more about uh, the certificate program we have there so you can get back to community college at no cost to you, child care provided, get your 16-week uh, uh, um, certificate program, and you've got a job. You've got a job in advanced manufacturing. You've got a job in nursing. We need nurses, that's for sure. Uh, you've got a job in a variety of other places where the skill set, um, we have to train people for the tens of thousands of jobs that we can't fill because people aren't trained for them. Scholarships, the Roberta Willis Scholarship, making college more affordable for everybody, independent as well as our public universities, um, what that's going to mean in terms of helping people get back to work. Workforce development, you've heard a lot of talk about um, training people for the jobs that are out there. I'll be able to introduce to you in just a minute uh, Terrence Chang. Terrence Chang is uh, amazing. He uh, led uh, UConn Stanford, uh, some amazing work study programs uh, in alliance with the local businesses there, getting people a uh, work experience while they're learning. And now he's going to be taking over our CSU system. He'll be able to talk a little bit about that. And uh, today we're at the Swift factory in North uh, Hartford, um, where it's an old factory. They used to do gold plating there. Um, it's been sitting empty for a while. A lot of the residents of the community said we walked by, saw this empty factory. What did it say about our community? What did it say about our future? And now it's filling up. It's filling up with entrepreneurs and the business people with a dream. And uh, not only will they be able to get a certificate so they got the skills they need, not only will child care be provided, but the Connecticut Future Fund, which I call the Connecticut Equity Fund, is there to provide $150 million in support to help the very smallest businesses get started so that they never lack for capital. And uh, those are some of the ways that we're trying to make sure that we get our state moving again in terms of job growth and opportunity, opportunity for everybody, nobody left behind. Uh, with that, let me reintroduce to you uh, Charlene Russell Tucker. Charlene is taking the lead on our summer program, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, where we are on that, what you can do to sign up, and a little further on about what we're doing in our schools and learning and teaching and jobs. Charlene? Thank you, Governor, and so awesome to be here to share more about what we're anticipating uh, a summer of uh, uh, enrichment and fun uh, for students. And I'm, I'm sure they can't wait uh, having the year that they've had. Enriching the lives of Connecticut students has been certainly a mantra and something I know the governor has been supporting. And we know that uh, back in April that we released uh, a, an application uh, to address uh, the issue of accessing camps uh, to parks and recreational or cultural centers to expand slots in those spaces and also to share funding for innovative enrichment programming grants so that all our students and families will have access this summer. And so we're really excited because we launched the application. It closes 
today at 5 p.m. And so folks can still get in their application. However, we're really pleased that as of right now, we have over 240 applications that have come in to us. And these are like YMCAs and parks and recreation and community-based organizations. So we're really excited for what lies ahead for our students uh, and our families uh, this summer. And we know uh, that after we award the grants, which will happen on May 24th, so very quick turnaround time because we want the planning to take place. But then we also know after the planning takes place, we want to make sure that kids have access, they know about it, and that they'll be there, right? If we build it, we certainly want them to come. Uh, so we will be working very hard to make sure that families and, or, or, and all our organizations know how to, to really direct our students to make sure that they can have access. So we're really excited about that opportunity that's available for our students and families. Again, enriching their lives and having a summer of fun and learning, which is so important after the year that they've had, as I've said before. So that's really exciting. The governor mentioned about the vaccinations. Uh, and so we're so thrilled for our 50% of our 16 and 17 year olds who have actually got in line and gotten their shots. And uh, you know, certainly kudos to our, our school districts that have worked with our students and certainly families so that they can access that. And as the governor mentioned, we know that the 12 to 15 year olds will be coming up really soon. And we're working the governor's office, the Department of Public Health, working together to ensure that information will be available to our districts to once again, make sure families know. And there's something to be said about kids being able to gather together their own peer pressure amongst each other uh, to be able to, to stand in line and to get their shots. So we're really excited about that to make sure families know, to make sure that we have the approvals necessary and the kids are able to do that. So we're really looking forward to that and really excited. So it will be a great and exciting summer for all of us. And again, we can't say enough thank you for our school districts that have worked so hard to ensure that our students have access to in-person learning. And again, for students to be ready. Some of our districts are also themselves working uh, to make sure enrichment and summer learning is available for our students. And so we continue to encourage them to leverage the summer programs that we are funding here with their local funds, municipalities as well. We've shared that information with our districts and we'll continue to encourage them to leverage and if necessary, match the state's investment so that we can make even more opportunities available for our students this summer. So with that, uh, thank you, Governor. Really appreciate the ability to share this information today. Hey, well said, Charlene. And uh, one of the ways we're getting these summer learning camps going is um, with our Connecticut College Corps. Uh, we'll be recruiting hundreds of Connecticut College um, students and um, high school seniors who are graduating to help as mentors and learning in, in these camps, and then some. And I'm really pleased that uh, the president of Fairfield University, Fairfield University is taking the lead on this and helping us recruit these uh, young people, helping to sign up. That's Mark Nemec. Mark, thanks for being here and what you're doing. Thank you so much, Governor. And good afternoon. It's great to be with you all. And Fairfield University is honored and humbled to serve as host and lead for the creation of the Connecticut College Corps. And Governor, again, I'd be remiss if I didn't say how appreciative we are of your support for this endeavor. You know, as a civic institution, which continues to attract more talented young people from across the country, we are also grateful for the partnership with our fellow independent and public colleges and universities, which stem from the Connecticut Higher Education Working Group's efforts to support the state's recovery from COVID-19. Now, the core itself is a program through which Fairfield University's Graduate School of Education and Allied Professions, having developed an innovative curriculum, will be preparing up to 500 college-age students this summer who will be placed in support of summer enrichment programs all around the state of Connecticut. Now, our staff has worked hard over the last week since getting the green light, has launched a website and an application, which just went live last Friday. And I'm pleased to report that we already have upwards of 50 applicants in just a few days looking to serve our young people. The training in the College Corps will take place in early June and focus on social emotional learning, discernment, academic support, and reflective practice. We have graduate students also lined up to then mentor the core members in small cohorts over the course of the summer. 
I again want to reiterate, this has been an incredibly collaborative effort among higher education institutions across the state. And it's a great opportunity for both our college students and our young people they will work with. And we at Fairfield University are thrilled to be part of it this year and beyond. Hey, Mark, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Mark can stick around, but I really appreciate um, what you're doing there. It does pay $4,500. So uh, college kids, if you're looking for something to do, uh, here's your opportunity. You can make a big difference. And finally, um, let me introduce to you my new best friend, uh, Terrence Chang. Terrence, um, as I said before, uh, UConn Stanford, going to be taken over, um, president of the CSCU system, um, loves Connecticut, and really has a real focus on folks coming through our system and how they can get broad-based education and a job. Terrence? Thank you, Governor, for having me today on the call. It's a real honor. And thank you again for your leadership through the pandemic. I mean, the numbers that you just uh, went through speak for themselves. We're doing great, and you and your administration have done a really great job. You know, in my career in higher ed, um, we've had some real success with public-private partnerships. Those partnerships help our students to gain real-world experience, but they also help students make an impact on industry and in their communities. So, you know, it's an amazing opportunity for me on July 1 when I take over the leadership for the Connecticut State College and University System because that's a system that's critical to the state's workforce pipeline. And that's what we need right now is a workforce pipeline that is going to reskill, upskill, and train the new and strong employees of the future. So giving all of the students, all of our students, a chance to have a great classroom education, but that education also has to prepare them to be positive and productive contributors to society. So to me, that's what higher ed is all about. Um, the Connecticut College Corps program is so exciting. I was so thrilled to read about it and to understand it as it was evolving. It's a testament, I think, to what you know the vision um, of our higher education system really should be. So I'll tell you, CSCU's 12 community colleges, the four universities, and Charter Oak State College, um, we're all ready to stand with that program and do whatever we need to do uh, to get the state back on its feet and to get those students that have been disrupted back on their feet. You know, the Connecticut College Corps program, I think speaks directly to our mission at CSCU, that mission of access, but also for social mobility for all of our citizens. So again, so many of the students across the state that have had their educations disrupted, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to bring them right back to where they should be and then to keep pushing them beyond. So uh, if we have any CSCU students that are going to be uh, watching this now or later, I encourage you to take advantage of this amazing opportunity. The governor just uh, told you you get a, a nice stipend to be a part of this, but you will grow personally as a leader and as a citizen, and you're going to help our state's children get back on their feet and come back even stronger. You know, this is hard work. But it's noble work, and we're ready to do it. So thank you, President Nemec, for really leading you and your university hosting the program. And just thanks again to the governor and your team for pulling us all together to tackle the challenge. All right. We're lucky to have you taking the lead at CSCU. So Terrence and Charlene are there, as, of course, are Josh and Paul. Any questions? Channel 3, Eyewitness News. Yes, Governor. My, my questions today are about kind of getting back to normal. Uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb was on Face the Nation yesterday, and he mentioned that if we're at a point where cases are at 10 per 100,000, that the mask mandate could be dropped indoors, outdoors, just altogether. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, my thought is, uh, as you know, um, the 19th next week, uh, we're going to relax uh, really all the business restrictions. Uh, we still have a significant number of our younger people who are not vaccinated, so we're going to have to uh, think a little bit uh, seriously about indoor masking a little bit longer, at least for that cohort. But um, I think uh, we'll have some good news within a week. Okay. And then, you know, also talking about getting back to normal, Dr. Fauci was saying that things would likely be back to normal across the U.S. by next Mother's Day. But from where we're sitting right now in Connecticut, when you take a look at the numbers that you showed earlier today, do you think that we're going to be back to normal by, by summer or at least during the summer months? I do. I really do. Um, 
Connecticut uh, and America is uh, really taking the lead on vaccinations. Uh, if we can keep this uh, trend going for another month in terms of people being vaccinated, I feel pretty confident, especially in this part of the country where you saw the infection rate drop off a lot uh, last summer. So we'll also have seasonality uh, on our side as well. So I feel pretty good about that. The fall, we'll see if there are variants or anything uh, that make us worry. But um, right now, I think it's a good summer. And, and my final point, and also kind of to that point, do we know the percentage of Connecticut businesses that are open to at least some degree right now? Uh, I think um, that's a real mixed bag, to tell you the truth. While a, a lot of businesses are saying you're welcome to come back, um, come back at 50 percent, I think you're finding a, a number of employees are still a little hesitant to come back. So I can't tell you how many are at full throttle right now. I can't tell you the state employees, the state of Connecticut, many of them are forward-facing, have been showing up, uh, taking care of their clients uh, in person over the last 12 months. Thank you very much. NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon, everyone. Is there enough Pfizer vaccine available in preparation for it opening up to 12 to 15-year-olds on Thursday? And has the state requested more doses of Pfizer from the federal government if necessary? I think we're in good shape there, aren't we, Josh? Yes. Yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, our providers did, in many cases, request additional Pfizer vaccine this week in preparation for 12 to 15-year-olds being uh, authorized uh, later this week. But we'll be very well prepared for that, uh, that additional expansion of eligibility. Can you talk a little bit more about the preparations being made to hit the ground running on that age group when it opens up? We're going to be having specific uh, clinics for schools, what we could see? Sure. Well, what, what we've learned in particular over the last month and a half vaccinating 16 and 17 year olds is that when parental or, or consent from a guardian is required, which will be the case for the 12 to 15 year olds, uh, weekends are really the preferred option. And so we'll have a lot of expanded access uh, this weekend coming up, um, both at our mass vaccination sites, uh, but also at pharmacies and you know, a number of local health departments are going to do clinics. So there will be a lot of options available for, for parents and their children who want to get vaccinated in the next week. You know, we are hearing a little bit about how parents themselves aren't hesitate to vaccinate themselves or their older children, those 17, 18 years old. But getting into the younger children, there's some hesitation there. How do you get past that obstacle? And I don't know if the commissioner has any thoughts on that as well. Well, I'll just add to that. It truly is about education and providing as much information as possible uh, for folks to be able to make those decisions. And we will certainly be working with uh, DPH and the governor's office to share information with our school districts that they can also pass on uh, to families. Thank you. You might just remember, Jamie, that um, Connecticut is a real leader in terms of overall um, young people getting vaccinated um, and uh, people in general getting the flu shot, which is voluntary. So while there's a lot of noise in and around vaccinations, uh, I think over time you're going to see more and more people with the confidence to know that allows their kid to get back to school safely. Thank you. News 8. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor Josh, you, when you talk about the um, – vaccination and the and the community 45 and, and older and and that group of people getting close to herd immunity um can once they get there if they do get there first can that start kind of a, a domino effect and are there any studies that would indicate maybe which group of people if it was more important for one group over another in terms of age to reach that herd immunity first try that josh well, as the governor mentioned earlier, I think herd immunity is a term that gets used um, in a lot of different ways, unfortunately. I mean, I, I think our goal is to get as many people in Connecticut vaccinated as possible, which cuts down on the risk of transmission, um, which means that we need to focus on younger people as well, um, as, as we were just discussing. But, you know, when you get up to the levels we're at now with 80 percent of the people 45 and above vaccinated, uh, those people, people 45 and above, represent 97% of the deaths that we've had in Connecticut from COVID-19. That gives us very robust protection 
among those who are most vulnerable and most at risk for severe illness and death from COVID. And that gives us a very fun, firm foundation upon which to you know, move forward with additional relaxation of the business restrictions as we'll be doing next week, as the governor mentioned. So we feel good about where we are, um, but we want to continue driving those vaccination rates up as high as we can just to continue to reduce the risk overall. And for the commissioner, when we're talking about moving forward, and, and kids being in person or, or not in person, and the school districts won't be required to offer uh, remote learning. Has there been any pushback in that regard? So uh, it is it is a mixed bag in terms of what we hear. Uh, our districts are certainly uh, preparing uh, for what needs to happen for the fall. Families are concerned, and so we provided interim guidance, but we'll certainly be developing further guidance uh, for districts to have uh, based on. Uh, what we're learning and what need what uh, we need to be thinking about with for students uh, who may be medical fragile and all of that. So we're we're really working very hard to make sure we have that guidance available for our districts uh, and so also for families to have. Fox sixty one. News 12, Connecticut. Hi, Governor. Um, just in really basic layman's terms, can you talk about what you're offering the nursing home workers and the nursing homes themselves to try to avoid this strike on Friday? Yeah, John, we're trying to do anything we can to avoid a strike. Um, the nurses at the nursing homes have been extraordinary throughout this COVID crisis, uh, taking care of the residents there, folks most in need, and uh, we need them uh, taking care of the residents now. And um, so, yes, we have put in place, um, you know, Paul and Melissa have taken the lead in negotiations with uh, SEIU, which is the labor union. You know, it's a significant package, um, real increase in terms of the Medicaid rates, uh, plus a 10 percent bump up to help the uh, nursing homes themselves increase in pay for the nurses, um, combat pay for the nurses. This is on top of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars last year as well. You know, and that included we did all the testing, uh, provided PPE as best we could throughout um, for the nursing homes. <clears throat> in addition, we're doing everything we can to accelerate or make it easier for those nurses if they have daycare needs to be at the front of the line to get discounted daycare plus a pension. So we've got an aggressive proposal on the table because there's nothing more important than taking care of our seniors. And um, I hope to God uh, the nurses are there to do it. So let, let me ask the follow-up question then. I know the letters just went out today, but and, and I can post this to Paul and, and Josh too. Um, have you gotten any indication that both sides are agreeable to this? Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> yeah, no, we've been in conversations with all the related parties, the nursing home pro, uh, providers, as well as the, the unions. As the governor has said, this is a very aggressive offer above and beyond of what the legislature has put in their proposed appropriations budget. Um, this, uh, we understand that there's an urgency. Um, and, and at the same time in which uh, the governor uh, directed uh, myself and Secretary McCall to put this offer on the table, uh, Commissioner uh, Deidre Gifford and our emergency management team with uh, Commissioner Ravella, as well as with the National Guard, are also having to prepare for the, if a strike does occur on Friday, and all the related elements in there. So they're, we're working on dual tracks, but the first track that the governor is most important to him is to get both the parties back in the room to negotiate um, in good faith with each other and to avoid uh, what can be a very disruptive strike if it occurred on Friday. And speaking of the legislature, are they going to go along with this? We have been in conversations with legislative leaders. They know that uh, uh, we have been having uh, these discussions over the weekend, uh, as well as today. We're keeping them in close, uh, um, we're keeping them up to date uh, on a day, uh, basically on a timely basis as it deals with this. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, I think they understand the urgency that we're in as well. And they also understand that the governor put on the table uh, a very aggressive offer uh, that very much um, is in alignment to the comments that have been made by legislative leaders about wanting to support uh, during this process. All right. Thanks, everybody.
the Associated Press. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Governor, could, could you respond to this Yale report on the nursing homes that's, that's out today that says the, the state didn't really hold them as accountable as they should have been held to some of the failures, especially early in the pandemic? Look, as you know, um, we were hit hard, along with all the other um, states and nursing homes in our region. Uh, first thing we did was we hired Mathematica, the leading independent uh, group, to say what we can learn in terms of nursing homes, what we could do better. We put in place really strict protocols in terms of infections, really strict protocols in terms of testing, which made available to everybody. Now we've got everybody in our vac uh, We prioritize the nurses in our nursing homes to get vaccinated, the patients to get vaccinated. Um, and we're, But look, there were some outliers. There's, there's um, not a lot of consistency. These are all private companies, these nursing homes, and some did better than others. Uh, we had to be really strict and really firm with nursing homes in terms of fines if they were not uh, following the protocols carefully. We had to shut down one nursing home where, you know, a nurse went off site and came back infected. Um, so I, I'd like to think that um, we started out OK and we got better and better. And today there are uh, no fatalities in our nursing homes. Thank you. In terms of the, um, the, the summer programs at the schools, any idea what the interest level is among students at this point and what would you consider successful in terms of getting these kids into some of these programs? Well, I'll take it and then kick it right to Charlene. But I got to tell you, I care deeply about the fact that while our schools were open, we have uh, close to 100,000 kids who haven't been in school. I hear the stress. I hear the need for socialization. So, yeah, there's some learning loss. We got to help people get back up to speed so they're ready to learn in the uh, fall. But there are also just some real social and emotional needs. That's why I love the College Corps. I love the mentors. I love the fact that they'll have free access to the aquariums and museums. I hope there's a lot of interest. Charlene? And, Governor, I would add success for us would be every child that needs it have access. Uh, and that learning is taking place everywhere, every day. And so we will work uh, double time to make sure after those programs are awarded that we make sure that our school districts and our families or community organizations, wherever families and kids are, will know uh, how to access those programs. We don't, we don't want anyone wanting to have a program and not be able to get there. And as you know, we've also launched the programs with our museums. And so folks can go there, uh, you know, our kids can go with families and also Paying, you know, having uh, the resources to do is not a barrier. So truly that's success. Every child that needs it have access. Great. And, and finally, do we know where we stand vaccination wise in comparison to the rest of the states? These are pretty high vaccination numbers. Are we at the top? Are we near the top? Do you have anything to quantify that? Uh, compared to other countries or go ahead, Josh. Compared to other states. Yeah, we, we've been, Connecticut's been pretty consistently in the top uh, two to three to four states in the nation since the vaccines became available in December in terms of the percentage of our population that's been vaccinated. As of today, we're number one in the nation in terms of the eligible population that's fully vaccinated um, and in the top two, three, four by almost every measure that you can slice it. So we're very grateful for the people of Connecticut and our providers who've worked so hard and, and so well over the last four or five months uh, to get us to these levels that give us the basis to get back to a new normal uh, here in Connecticut. Thank you very much. Hearst Connecticut Media. Hi, for either uh, Governor or Paul, do we have an estimate of the number of nursing home residents that could be impacted by the strikes on May 14th? Do you have that, Paul? Um, we're, we'll probably say close to uh, a, a thousand at this time. And how about an estimate of how many might need to be relocated, um, you know, if a deal or agreement isn't able to be reached in time? Well, we do not have that firm number at this time. But that's part of the plans that the um, various operators have to submit to you as um, the strike contingency plans? Yes, they have to uh, submit uh, strike contingency plans uh, to the Department of Public Health. At that time, Department of Public Health will review those plans, which they are currently doing. Those plans were uh, due uh, late last night. Um, if those plans are insufficient, then uh, there will be other actions that the state would have to take 
as it deals with the health and wellness of the residents of the facilities. What are the actions that the state would take? Uh, one of which would have to do with a potential evacuation into other facilities if the plans are insufficient for the individuals to be in the facilities in which they're currently in. And those facilities could be in-state and or out-of-state? Correct. Okay. And then, Governor, you're able to put this um, aggressive proposal on the table, as you called it, due to the, the hundreds of millions in unspent Medicaid funds. Is that correct? Or We're able to put it work? on the table because... Um, you know, we're running a surplus. We're able to put it on the table because we had already projected increases uh, in our original budget submission. We're able to put it on the table because we also have additional federal support, and it's the right thing to do. Um, look, I think um, we're doing everything we can to avoid this strike. I know what it means to the seniors. I know how tough it's been over the last year for them. And as Paul said, we also have some contingencies if uh, people insist on striking. And then last question related to the, the summer proposals. Um, what do you need from the legislature to accomplish that? And, and what kind of signals have you gotten from them on the plan? Paul? Well, the, the legislature will need to um, move forward and approve the, the federal funding package that the governor presented to them. I know that uh, we have heard initial uh, word from them that they were very pleased with the package that put forth and they wanted to make some modifications. So Secretary McCall uh, and myself and uh, Josh Jabal on behalf of the governor will be having those conversations with the legislature so they can take it up in earnest in both chambers and to the governor's desk for his final signature. Uh, we just received today uh, final guidance from the Treasury about the usage of the dollars and uh, OPM is going uh, through that uh, accordingly. And so that means that we will be receiving uh, those federal funds very soon. So uh, the quicker that we can move in terms of the legislature uh, approving the package the governor has presented to them, the quicker we can uh, get these programs up and going and getting uh, our, our kids uh, in various programs uh, that will uh, support their overall enrichment. The Connecticut Mirror. Thanks, Max. Uh, Governor, I wanted to talk to you a little, little bit more about uh, the numbers I, uh, on the nursing home. I realize you can't negotiate in the press, but one of the big things that seems like it's been separating uh, you so far from the legislature is the willingness to use state dollars. Uh, the Appropriations Committee budget puts more state dollars into nursing homes in the coming biennium. Yours did not. Uh, we're still waiting for the Appropriations Committee's proposal for the American Rescue Plan, but Senator Austin uh, called reporters today and talked about what they're looking to do there for nursing homes. That's more federal dollars than you've put in. Can you tell us at least if your aggressive proposal taps state money or are you just relying on federal to try to solve this? No, Keith, it, it uses uh, state money as well. Um, so people have the confidence that four and a half percent increase goes beyond uh, the, uh, the first two years. It includes uh, a surcharge or um, an upgrade of 10 percent for nursing homes for the first nine months. But look, you know finance. I mean, a lot of these nursing homes are running on a very, very thin margin. They're leveraged to the eyeballs. They got a lot of bank debt, so they don't have a lot of room. And when they sit around with a 30% vacancy, they're not making as much money. So to me, I wanted to do everything I could to get money right to the nurses, right to the frontline workers who deserve it. So yes, we're doing a lot with the Medicaid increase, also trying to get some uh, monies right to the nurses themselves. And then just one quick follow, Governor. Um, technically, it might seem to the, to the viewers like the nursing homes are negotiating with the state, but, but technically they're really negotiating with the homes, which have their own big ask. They're asking for like $300 million more a year. Um, can you really avert a strike just by putting in money for raises and staffing, or do you also need to a certain extent prop up the industry? Um, that, that, in other words, cover that's some an of excellent losses. question. Hey, look, we are there trying to bring peace between the nursing home operators, private operators, and uh, 1199 SEIU. And uh, we do fund uh, almost all the expenses there with Medicaid, Medicare, and um, so um, the feds do Medicare. So we're trying to put together a package that makes the most sense. But you're right. People are asking us to prop up an industry that's going through real transition right now. Uh, there was a lot of vacancy in the nursing homes before COVID. There's a lot more of vacancy now after COVID. 
We're finding um, the true up or giving an extra 10 percent for, say, um, 10 months. And let's see what the norm looks like. Maybe more people are going to be doing home health care in the future. And we're going to make sure we have an industry that uh, reflects that. Thank you. The Hartford Current. Hi, Governor. It's Eliza Fawcett with The Current. Um, we recently visited some vaccine clinics and saw that it was pretty slow. Um, most people were there for second doses, it seemed, um, which suggests that the rate of vaccinations is going to fall off pretty significantly in a few weeks. So what happens at that point? Well, as you know, we're pulling out every um, trick in the bag we can to incent people to get vaccinated. And uh, I prefer incentives. I prefer uh, urging people to do the right thing. And um, so far, I've been pretty pleased. I mean, I remember just a couple months ago, oh, my God, 50 percent of the people are so scared of vaccines, they'll never get vaccinated. And now we have the overwhelming majority of our folks uh, over the age of 40 have been vaccinated. That's a very good sign. But you're right, things may be trailing off for younger people. We may have to think of other ways to incent them to get vaccinated. Thanks. I also had a reader question. Um, so when the FDA authorizes the vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds, how soon will parents be able to take their kids to a clinic? Could that happen you know, that evening if it happens at 3 p.m. in the afternoon or would it take a while longer? Pretty fast, right, Josh? That's right. Um, you know, as has been communicated so far, we're expecting the ASAP committee um, to meet Wednesday afternoon, evening. Um, and potentially, you know, we're not sure, but potentially there could be guidance given uh, that night. And if that's the case, our providers will be ready the following day. So, you know, we'll, we'll be ready to go essentially as soon as we get clear guidance and direction from the federal government um, and the necessary instructions for our providers, um, uh, we'll be ready to go right away. Thanks. And one last question for you, Governor. Um, your counterparts in Arkansas, Montana, and South Carolina are canceling the $300 in extra unemployment benefits from Washington, I guess, in a move to prod workers back to their jobs. Um, what's your position on that, and is that something that you would consider? Uh, I don't think so. Um, look, the, the $300 true-up ends in September, so there's a time fuse on it. But we have I have had discussions with um, – Washington about how we give people incentives to get back to work, not just um, $300 while they're not working. Thanks very much. The Day of New London. Hi, everyone. It's Sten Spinell with The Day. Um, this is for Ms. Russell Tucker. Can you tell us what you'll be looking for in particular in these grant applications from uh, YMCA's, Parks and Recs, other organizations? So thank you. So the grant application really asks for uh, programs to tell us the programming that they will be uh, providing. It also asks for a budget. Uh, and so it's just several those um, basic things that we wanted to know. What are you doing? What's your staffing? It also asks whether they need staff and support, which goes back to the college core that would make that connection for them. Uh, and uh, for the innovation grants, it's really about what are you planning to do uh, that's new and different and innovative uh, for uh, enrichment at, uh, opportunities and activities for students. Thank you. Um, and just one more, this is for anyone. For the upcoming school year, what kind of options do students and parents have uh, if they want to learn remotely and they're some of the only ones in the class asking to do so? I know, uh, Governor, you said that they will be accommodated, but how exactly, um, what exactly will that look like? Charlene, what exactly will that look like? It's a great question, Governor, and we're working on it as we speak uh, because there's also legislation right now that's proposed uh, that will ask the, the department to develop some standards around remote learning. And so those are the questions that we really need to, to consider as we recognize it's so critically important for our students, for their emotional, uh, social emotional well-being, that they are indeed connecting with their, with their peers and connecting with their student, with their teachers in person, and we know how important that is. And so we continue to share that information, and even with families, uh, that the in-school learning opportunities is really the best uh, for students, uh, understanding that there may be issues that we need to think about, uh, and that's why we will develop additional guidance for our districts. 
Okay, great. Is there any sense of when that guidance will be, um, you know, sent out to schools? So we're working on that right now. And I would say within the next, you know, month or so, we will be able to do that. Our districts certainly want to be planning. Uh, and so we're working as quickly as we can to do that. Thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks. Just a, a clarifying question on this um, the, the school, uh, summer school programs. I was under the impression that this was $11 million that was coming from the ARPA allocation directly to the State Department of Education. So, one, I'm not sure that legislative approval is required for this particular initiative. Am I wrong there? I believe the 11 million is uh, what's coming from our sta <clears throat> state allocation. That's our share. That's our 20% share of what we're getting for education, more broadly speaking, Paul. What Charlene was saying was uh, hopefully our, um, our mayors and our superintendents of schools will match us on that so that money goes right to their school, school district or goes right to their community so we can expand the summer enrichment program for their students. Yeah. And also, Paul, I was also mentioning that there's there's other dollars that are connected to what's the proposal for the legislature uh, that it's part of our greater enrichment uh, agenda that would have to get approved as well. Okay. Um, is there anything in the interim rule uh, from the Department of Treasury that was issued today that affects proposals in your plan adversely, uh, something that you wanted to do but uh, now looks like uh, you may not be able to do? Or is there something that you thought you couldn't do and now you will be able to if uh, you can come to an agreement with the legislature? Uh, as, as we are in this press conference at this time, uh, Secretary McCall and her uh, team are reviewing uh, that guidance with our DC Director Dan Simone. so we'll have more information on that uh, in the coming days. Okay. And um, uh, Josh, can you give us any update on where what's happening with the second uh, FEMA mobile van and what are happening with the, I'm assuming, do we have all 35 uh, Griffin Health vans uh, out in the road now? I believe the second FEMA mobile unit is uh, mobilizing this week and um, tracing the path of the first unit uh, to pick up uh, second dose appointments where necessary. And, um, you know, we're continuing to work with our local health partners and, and others to uh, deploy the fleet of, uh, of yellow vans as well. We're continuing to work on our strategy there. Uh, based on what we've learned over the first month, you know, looking to provide additional support uh, for locating and, and doing outreach to drive attendance at those uh, vans, looking at different uh, local incentive partnerships that we can stand up, also looking at moving them around a little less. Uh, one of the things we're, we think we've learned is that if we can park them in the same place for a longer period of time, people become aware that they're going to be there, they can, they can um, plan around that. Um, so there's a bunch of different strategies we're looking to continue to maximize that opportunity. But all 35 are out on the road now, right? Um, not, not all deployed at the same time yet. Um, that's uh, part of what these strategies are developed to support is the ability to get all of them effectively out on the road at the same time in, in ways that they can be fully utilized. Okay, and uh, Governor, there was another uh, committee vote in appropriations today on uh, advancing legislation that would uh, uh, create a rebuttable presumption uh, in worker comp law that uh, COVID's a work-related illness uh, if certain requirements are met. I uh, just wanted to check if there's been any change in your uh, opposition to that uh, proposal. Well, certainly a limitation on that proposal. Um, first of all, if... Um, it seems to me if you're an employee, your employer says uh, you have an opportunity to get vaccinated, we'll pay for the vaccination, here's the vaccination, and you refuse to get vaccinated, um, it seems to me that presumption is uh, could be challenged. <laughs> okay. And uh, just, uh, I know I've asked you this before, just want to clarify since we're talking about uh, possibly setting up vaccination clinics for 12 to 15 year olds. There, there are no plans at this moment to acquire uh, a COVID uh, vaccination to attend public and private schools and licensed daycare uh, programs in the state. No, Paul, there are no plans for that. But, uh, you know, this keeps coming up. What if people don't get vaccinated? Um, are there plans this way? Um, uh, you're going to do remote learning if they don't 
get get vaccinated. That answers all these questions. That means that you can go to the restaurant safely. You don't have to worry about who's been vaccinated, who hasn't. You can go to school safely. We don't have to worry about you don't feel safe, so you got to go remote learning. Um, if people get vaccinated like they do for all the other vaccines, uh, we're going to be in very good shape. Okay, thank you very much. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, Governor, let me take another swing at Paul's question just then. Uh, would you rule out that uh, requiring vaccinations, uh, COVID vaccinations for schools? Uh, it's my least popular uh, option, but um, I think people have got to be vaccinated getting back into that classroom. I'm going to have a hard time getting teachers into that classroom if people aren't vaccinated. But, um, you know, obviously for the younger grades, that's different. That's why we're going to require the masks, uh, at least through the end of this uh, school year. And we'll see where we are next year. But um, I feel very confident that um, teachers will all be vaccinated, staff will all be vaccinated, and people know they can get to school safely. Is there some threshold of our percentage of uh, students you think should be vaccinated before you would consider that? Well, Hugh, I mean, remember, um, nobody under the age of 12 is going to be vaccinated. So um, they're in a separate category of their own. So let's give us a little time to see... um, what, what the mood of the nation is at that point. But uh, I think uh, I'm hesitant to do any mandates at this point. Okay. Uh, I want to also ask about the, the cannabis bill. I mean, we're about a month out from the end of the session. Has there been any movement there in negotiations? I can tell you that, um, you know, Paul and his team put together a very complete uh, law for consideration by the legislature. It's sitting on their desk, and we're ready for some decisions, Paul. I think you said it directly, uh, Governor. Um, uh, our, our negotiating team, led by Jonathan Harris, have been meeting with legislative uh, negotiators. Uh, we are waiting for them to provide us uh, a revised draft. Um, in the meantime, um, we also are now getting work on a budget, making sure we stop a nursing home strike, uh, moving forward with game legislation and ensuring that the governor has a budget that is uh, supportive of his overall goals. So we have a lot of things that we need to work on in the month of May. So um, we'll be waiting to hear back from the legislature on this. Yeah, as you kind of just said, there's a lot of other stuff going on right now. Do you still look at that and see it as a realistic, likely proposal this year? Or are you thinking it's sort of fall off the wayside um i would say this the governor has has stated that um a governor a a bill that can get to his desk that represents uh what he feels he can sign he will sign with that said we have a lot of things we need to do in the month of may in a very short session in addition to managing our our covid protocols and everything of the such so time is of the essence when it comes to this uh piece of legislation as it deals with all pieces of legislation um, and uh, the no- negotiators on the legislative side understand that, and uh, we're waiting to hear back from them. Okay, thanks. I had just one quick question probably for Josh. Um, I think I heard you guys say that 50% of 16- and 17-year-olds have been vaccinated. I didn't uh, – what, what's the 18-45 uh, through 45 cohort, like, broken out? How many of those folks have been uh, vaccinated? Interestingly, slightly lower. So the 18- to 24-year-old uh, cohort is at about 45%. So, um, you know, perhaps the influence of parents there a little bit on their, on their uh, uh, 16 and 17 year olds, which in a, in a positive way. But I think as the governor has pointed out many times, it's those college age students in particular, the, the young 20 somethings that, uh, you know, we think we're gonna have to, we have the most work to do. But nonetheless, uh, you know, at 45%, you know, we've made great progress in a, in a month, month, a little over a month. Um, but that's really a main area of focus right now in terms of incentives and a lot of the things that the governor has been talking about. Okay. Thanks, everybody. All right, I'm getting the signal. First of all, let me thank uh, Mark over at Fairfield University, all your help with the College Corps. Let's get those guys going. Um, uh, Terrence Chang, you're um, you're hitting the ground running, man. Thank you for that. And um, we're going to be there as your ally, doing everything we can to give those kids the best opportunity at the CSU system. And uh, Charlene, talk about hitting the ground sprinting. Uh, you've picked up what we're doing to get these kids um, the very best opportunity uh, starting this summer. No time wasted. Here, I guess, let me just say something very positive. Um, 
we had more visits to the state of Connecticut last year to our beaches and our parks. Who would have thunk it in the middle of COVID? Uh, obviously, more people moving into the state of Connecticut, rediscovering the state of Connecticut. We started out talking a little bit about jobs, and really it's the hospitality, restaurant, service sector that's been hardest hit. Came up with some of the plans we have to help. Another one is just marketing the state to people in the greater region and beyond so they come and rediscover the beauty that is uh, Connecticut. So we have a plan. It's called Say Yes to Connecticut. You know, usually we have uh, about a million to two million dollars to market the state of Connecticut. We got a plan in front of the legislature to uh, multiply that by a factor of 10, say 15 million dollars. A lot of that, you're right, is, um, you know, federal aid money. That's going to help rediscover this state, bring people to the state. Maybe someone want to stay. Surely I hope they go to one of our amazing restaurants, stay in one of our hotels, and visit one of our amazing beaches or uh, take a hike. Um, that's what we're trying to do is people rediscover what makes Connecticut so special. Thanks, everybody, and special thanks to our guests.